how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. We are currently covered in snow outside. Yay. Yeah. I don't mind it, actually. I mean, we have some years where March is a beautiful, warm, very spring, and then some years it's like this when, you know, we can use some moisture, so. Well, last year it was really cold. We might have a repeat of that. Maybe, but at least it's coupled with moisture. So I don't really mind it. Yeah. So it's been snowing. It seems like almost every night for the last yeah. little bit, it snows and then it melts during the day. And then we get more snow the next night and then it melts during the day to where it almost feels like spring by the end of the next day. Yeah, like, right. yeah the sun's out, it's 80 degrees in the greenhouse. And anyway, I, I kind of like it. It makes me feel more restful. I feel like we're fairly like caught up with projects. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like seed starting and all of that, I mean, things are just chugging along. So Yeah, you seem to be more on top of, uh, like seed starting before seemed to take you a lot longer. Yeah, I think, you know, you hone your process over a period of time. There's also things that I'm not doing this year. I'm not gonna start, I don't think, I mean, never say never, but none of my tomatoes and peppers, I'm not gonna do any of that mm. this year because I just don't feel it. I just wanna get the stuff, the, the tomatoes that I know perform really well and that I really like the flavor of. Last year I grew like some 30 different varieties, totally not worth it. And they were like really neat looking, uh, lots of different colors and shapes and things like that, but. Do you think that once we get high tunnel set up that you can grow under that you might feel differently? Maybe. Like not this year, but next year you might want to do that again? Yeah, it was kind of an off tomato year for most everybody in our valley. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some years we'll have a year that the beans don't do well or, you know, this or that. You know, last year it was tomatoes. They just collapsed. Like mm. a bunch of us just had tomatoes collapse under who knows what. The intense heat. Most of the time they love it. It was just a very weird year. Yeah. So hoping for a better year. And I'm actually excited to go pick out my packs. I kind of miss that. You know, when we start all of our own seeds, I don't go down and shop for those pack plants like I used to and look at all the varieties that they have. And so I'm very excited to go do that. Anyway, all of, all of that said, we should jump into the videos from this past week. Uh, the first one was planning out our brick patio. Oh, I find it that one funny because you were kind of dragging your feet on even filming any part of that. Yes. And that was like our most successful video from the week. You know, for me, it's just... I'm always so afraid that we don't capture it in a way that's very easy to see. Yeah, you know what I mean? It right. always feels like a mess when we're in the middle of yeah. filming it. It feels like, you know, can anybody even see the lines that we're painting or, or you know, marking out? It's taking an awful lot of, of time to do something that you can't see any results from. Um, but it was really fun to kind of hash through. I mean, not at the moment. <laughs> that video did not show our frustration. <laughs> Aaron and I don't do projects like that well at all like we together yeah when it involves precision and measuring we have completely different attack plans yeah. to get it done like from two opposite corners here's the thing though is you and i are oftentimes both successful in whatever methods we have yeah but neither one of us wants to go along with well, yeah the neither of us will yield wants to do yeah. yeah so we did it my way then we did it aaron's way we both like we did it both of our ways it takes a lot longer and there's a lot more strife but in the end we're very happy with it and happy with each other uh, and then my mom came over and gave her thoughts, which was nice. It's always like a confirmation for me. It makes me feel like, okay, I'm going to go forward. Because when you get a, a pair of eyes that hasn't been in it all day long, yeah. looking at it, then they can point out things that maybe you didn't see. I feel or... like that's smart in any area of life. Yeah. To get a second pair of eyes on whatever you're doing. Right. Yeah. Anyway, we got the whole brick patio thing laid out. Benny's supposed to come by once there isn't snow on the ground. Hopefully our paint lines are still there. They probably will be. Hopefully. Uh. Kelly said, you two inspire so many of us by sharing your hard work and passion in the garden. Have you considered creating additional pillars at the other openings by the truck parking area and chicken coop to match the pair planned by the Hartley? Yes, so there's gonna be pillars all over the place. So there will be a set of them by the stone stair that we were working by. There'll be a set that match in front of the Hartley and then again on the other side. All of them will have matching containers or lights or whatever we decide to go with. And then we will have something to indicate the opening by our parking area as well. I kind of want to let that area evolve just a little bit because I'm not sure how we would place them, mm -hmm. you know, pillars anyway. We can um, always add them later. They don't have to go in right. first thing. Yeah, but I think it's a good idea to have that cohesion, especially in this area that we are kind of tying another formal cutout space yeah. to, you know, I don't know. The ash tree definitely needs to go though. Yeah, the other, by taking the ash tree out, could you gain another parking spot? Yeah, we could. And, and I offered that as an option of like, maybe we park, you know, on the chicken coop side of things, which I don't think you like the idea of. You know. A little bit farther to walk. 
yeah, it's not the walking. It's just the, like, I would love to organize things to where we didn't have to park our vehicles outside. Yeah. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen. It's not practical to how we live. I mean, we could park one of them in the barn and have mm, one yeah. of them out still. But we have st- too much stuff. It's like, you know, the barn is filled with too many things that we actually we do use. use. We're constantly purging stuff, constantly. Yeah. I think, you know, when you have now like eight and a half acres or whatever that we have, and we use a lot of it, you know, like people that have that much space, they have barns and they fill them with things Mm -hmm. and they also have a garage. Right. We also do a lot of decorating and Christmas lights and things like that. So our loft is full of supplies that we don't have to want to have to rebuy. It's not junk. It's not like a bunch of stuff that we don't use. Right. And it's, it's pretty organized. It's just, it'd be very tight to put both the vehicles in the barn. I know it really would be. Who knows? It's really not that big of a deal, but the loss of the ash tree, I forgot to show you in the video and I said I would, um, it's, we're going to have it taken out because there's one trunk. It's the biggest of the th- three or four trunks that that tree has, um, it has huge bore damage. It had bore damage when we moved in and I, I don't know. Ash trees are just prone to bores in our area. And if you don't chemically treat them every year, they will get bores and they will start to get weak and lose branches and or limbs or trunks. Uh, so that one is like inevitable. It will mm-hmm. come down at some point if we don't remove it. And it just feels like a liability. So we've talked about maybe replacing it with another tree in that area because it does provide a lot of shade and it's a really pretty structure sure. in that space. And we still can park in front of the chicken coop. I don't know. I think I would have to see it after the ash is removed to yeah. see how... Because like, you can always put another one in that spot. Yeah. Get the lay so of the So long land. as we have them like really take out the roots right the trunk or or stump yeah stephanie said i would do a big round fire pit in the center so cozy have you thought about running gas there along with water and electricity do you have a fire pit area right off of that brick patio we have an outdoor fireplace so i love fireballs so like anytime somebody suggests that i'm like yes you need to have one in your yard but we do have one very very close like a couple steps away the other thing that's really convenient too is having just a fire bowl that you can put out in the lawn yeah. And then and then move it, like take it out. Because you can, if you Fit. put it out in our backyard, uh-huh. you can get as many people around it right. as you want. Whereas you're not, you know, you're just not limited on space. Our, our outdoor fire, fireplace area is very cozy. Yeah. It you can really fit like, we fit. Oh six boy. or seven max. Uh, yeah. We've had like 10, maybe 12 in that space. And it's like, well, it's we have big furniture in there mostly too. Mostly comfortable with four people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and Susan said, what about the diseased tree you were going to show us? Yeah, that was the ash tree and I completely forgot. Sorry. I'll show you in in another video here soon. Ron said, your mother is a true delight, but I'm not sure I've ever heard an introduction. You know, I don't think to introduce her very often because I know her as mom and I know her name. I just don't introduce her as mom. (laughs) And you know, I have done a formal introduction maybe a couple of times. I just don't think to do it every time. Her name is Susan. So there you go. Uh, Kelly said, would you ever consider using use for the screening shrubs? We should try it sometime. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. I think Do they get really wide? Well, you know, we started planting, some do. Okay. It's kind of like privets or, uh-huh. you know, some get massive and some, yeah. some stay a little bit smaller. Uh, but we started planting the Stonehenge Dark Druid. Mm-hmm. That's a proven winner's uh, shrub. That's a fairly new introduction. And it grows four feet tall by three feet wide. And that would be mm. a really interesting one to try. Uh, the thing that's nice about yews is that they're kind of like boxwoods and that they can do sun or shade. But I don't know if they're as good as boxwoods in our full, full sun based on like what I can remember from the garden center days. Wasn't there some controversy about people planting yews With because deer. they're poisonous to deer? Yeah, we had one, win- well, the one winter where we had the 52 some inches of snow, um, deer came down because they were being like kind of pushed out of their sure. homes. And then they started eating people's yews and they were just dying off like. Right, because it was the only thing that they right, could find. Could, could find. Uh, we don't have deer in our garden or our area right here. Uh, so it wouldn't be a- something that we would need to right. consider. Which, you know, yeah. I guess just consider that if you have right, deer, yeah. you know? <laughs> it would be an interesting one to try in lieu of boxwoods because yeah. possibly better better with mites. Uh, we pos- should find a place, like maybe not in that location. I've got some. I wintered some over. But we should try like a, like a place that we want to hedge. Mm-hmm. Maybe there. You know, the thing is, like plants, you can... That's kind of the whole point of gardening is right. that, you know, how many plants have you killed? <laughs> 
a lot. Today's recap video is sponsored by Power Planter, who is a company who makes augers. If you've watched us plant anything out in the garden, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, I'm using an auger to dig the hole. It's been a game changer for us. It speeds up the process. Um, and they've got lots of different sizes. We use the nine inch, the five inch, and the three and a half inch augers the most at I think 30 inches tall. I think it's just a three inch. Is it a three inch? Yeah. Yeah. At 30 inches tall because I can stand and do the holes in the garden. So it eliminates, you know, having to, you know, bend up and down to do that too. So it's just been easier on my body and makes our job a lot more efficient. So uh, they also come in a lot of other sizes and different colors. So they make for fun gifts for gardeners in your life. If you want to learn more about it, we will link their website down below. So thank you, Power Planter, for sponsoring today's video. Dustin said, I wonder why you don't use rhododendrons or azaleas as evergreens in your area. They are great and can grow almost everywhere, except for here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are other spots where they can't grow uh, as easily, but we are super high pH. Those plants prefer a lower pH soil, more acidic soil. So we struggle with those like we do with blueberries and no one plants them. We used to try. We used to, we tried to do rhododendrons specifically. And I remember starting to phase them out down at the garden center because people would buy them when they're in bloom because they are pretty when they're in bloom. Uh, and then they would look real crummy during the winter time. Like they would, they were mm -hmm. not a good evergreen. And then in the spring they would come back for a replacement plant because most <laughs> of them were dead. Um, anyway, we kind of got tired of replacing people's It'd be rodents. interesting to try it somewhere and, and stay on like a three times a year with soil acidifier. We say that about so many things. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we need to talk about the tree video, the soil acidifier. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that right now. Okay. So we put a video out. Well, it was a reel on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, like YouTube Shorts, I think, TikTok, Instagram. Like it every, went everywhere, everywhere. I think, yeah. Um, and we just showed, actually, Paul demonstrated for us the how we fertilize our younger trees. And in that video, we were using soil acidifier, or Paul was using soil acidifier and tree tone. And I said that soil acidifier was ammonium aluminum sulfate. And why did you say that? Because Aaron wrote that down on the, the paper <laughs> for me to read. It is not aluminum sulfate. That is the synthetic version of a soil acidifier. Right. Uh, it is elemental sulfur. And, and gypsum. And gypsum. So a couple of you guys were like, I don't think that's yeah, right. Somebody, somebody was like, and rightfully so, they were like, aluminum, organic? Hmm. You know what? You wrote it down for me to read, and it I just... did not even, re yeah. it didn't register. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> like... <laughs> chemist i don't know if that's the right word but like <laughs> but i they think they both do the same thing it's kind of like you know you can put iron or you can put chelated iron mm -hmm. and like chel and so it's not like wrong you're no. you know if you do it that's it's why not we didn't like, take the video down yeah you're not, not a wrong. bad person for yeah. putting aluminum sulfate in the ground because that's uh -huh. what a lot of people do but if you're going for the organic approach you're elemental not sulfur yeah. and gypsum and that's what soil acidifier is so anyway well, spoma soil acidifier right because you can acidify your soil i think with aluminum sulfate yeah. but anyway so it's just so we make you know mistakes like that every once in a while yeah <laughs> we we thought about should we take it down you know and then... i almost sent because it had a spoma stuff in there i almost sent it to a spoma before we put it up because like they didn't ask us to make that video. No, and, and they they didn't say anything about it either. Yeah, they never told uh -uh. us anything. Um, I think that they saw it because I saw. Yeah, they the were commenting commented. on it, and they never said. Anything. So whoever runs their Instagram saw it, but um, yeah, it wasn't like they asked us to do it. We just we were showing how we wow, do we trees. Do it, and yeah. I, but sometimes I'll do that. I'll send it to companies just to be like, did I get you know? Did we get this hundred percent right? Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, and we got it wrong. Well, and you know what? That's okay. If things like that happen. It doesn't matter. Karma said, why brick the new area? Why not just brick the edges and continue with the gravel? Which is a thought. Hmm. But I think that that would be too much gravel. I think there needs to be a change. You know, we had the brick in there before. Mm -hmm. And I, I did like it. I didn't like that it was uneven. I didn't like that there were those openings, random openings yeah. all throughout. Were there plants? Did they plant plants in well, there Well, remember when we moved in, there was a couple lavender plants. Yeah. And it looked like there maybe had been like a tree or so. I don't know. I don't know what had well, been there. I did like the brick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I liked the idea of the brick. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of why we're leaning that direction. And I think it's good too, to um, use some of the same elements, but change things up a little bit along the way so that the space feels a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise it would feel like a giant sea of gravel because it'd be gravel around the Hartley, gravel driveway, gravel, oh, sure. brick, you know, it would yeah. be too much. Definitely cheaper and easier to do. Like that's the first thing that ran through my mind. I'm like, oh, should we do that? Yeah. That would cost us like thousands of dollars less yeah. than putting in a brick patio. 
Uh, but I just I think also we already bought the brick. Yeah, we do it's have the brick. Here, so. <laughs> so basically, at this point, we're we're uh, going to be paying for the labor. Yeah. Carolina said, "How about a nice flower tree, like a crab apple or something like that, in the middle? Since you'll probably have a fountain in the Har- Hartley's formal garden. You know, I think it would run into the golden rain tree. I think it'd be a little bit too crowded to put it right in the center. Um, and I think that's not the look I want. I think I want something I want tall on the outsides and have it come down into the middle." something smaller. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think scale wise that might work out a little bit better. I mean, who knows? People do all kinds of fun stuff that ends up looking really pretty. I'm kind of vying for a fountain. I think that a fountain would be the prettiest thing. She's like water. Do water. Yeah. A water feature. You know, if we did water there, then I could keep the fountain behind the chicken coop, which I love to look at. Mm -hmm. For some reason, like if I look out our second story windows down at the Hartley and I can see the pathway that goes behind the chicken coop and I can see that fountain, it's a really pretty vista. It truly is. And I kind of, I thought if we did a fountain behind the Hartley in the middle of those four beds, I'd have to move the chicken coop fountain Mm. because that's too much water too close together. So if we have a fountain in the brick patio area, we'll have the kind of tucked in one behind the chicken coop and we'll do something more solid, not water in the middle of the Hartley. If you do hedging though, then you can do as many fountains as you want because each room gets their own. It's true. You know, this garden space, the sun is coming out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway, this garden space is going to evolve so much as things mature. Yeah. I mean, it right now it's so incredibly open, uh, but there's stuff planted. I mean, it just needs to get some size so that things start to feel roomed in a little bit more. That's what we're going to go for in the end, except for our massive, expansive lawn up in the front area. But the kids love it. It's so fun to play out on that. Also, I love it. Yeah, you do love it. Uh down sprig lane said can you film when you put the electrical in the center i want to do something similar but have no idea where to start or how to accomplish something like that pretty much just uh trench it call an electrician they'll do it either like yeah hand dig it uh to code however far that is 24 inches maybe Mm -hmm. and then you just put conduit in there there's really not anything to it sure and you put whatever i mean you can put whatever size conduit you want i always like to opt for larger size conduit Mm -hmm. i think it's worth the money because yeah. you never know when you need to run two or three yeah. more things in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yep. But definitely we, we could see if we could film it. We usually have some, you know, Burke Electrical usually does it for us here. And um, I don't know how comfortable they are with cameras on them. Yeah. <laughs> They're usually um, pretty good. But we could ask. Next video was two days down at the garden center for new plant loads. And my goodness, was the weather bad? at least the first day, they got two big loads, two semi loads of plants from Bountiful Farms and J.F. Schmidt. So lots of trees and evergreens. Uh, And it was fun. It's always fun to be down there when you, you know, get to kind of see all the new stuff that's coming in. There's that excitement. Um, So I spent one day and then part of, well, almost the rest of the next day um, down there just kind of helping with whatever they needed help with, which meant uh, moving some fruit trees around, untying trees, Um, tagging special order stuff. I marked like four things for us, uh, one of which I think is going to go to uh, your sister's house, my Mm. sister-in-law's house. Um, And then one is a flavor top nectarine to replace the pear behind our flower shed and then a couple other fun fun things. But it's always fun uh, just to be down there. Amber said, can we see the pictures that Aaron's father sends you of the Indian magic crab apple, please? I'll find a few of them. He actually sent me one like the next day I have, after I talked yeah. about it and I was like, I just talked about you in a video yeah. uh, because there was snow like stacked up on the branches and a robin sitting in it. So pretty. Uh, Chris said, what happened to your magnolia tree you bought last year? It's chilling behind the greenhouse. I just didn't, couldn't figure out where I wanted to put it and it's doing great. So there you go. I mean, if it does great over winter in a container, it should do it in the ground as long as it likes our soil pH. Alice said, can you please put up the video link to your demo on making that double layer planting box that you showed in this video? Oh my goodness. I would love to see how to make it. Is that one even still available? Yeah, I think that one's still there. Oh, I don't want to put the link up to that. You can go search in the depths of our video library. That would have been 2014. Maybe. Is that the first year? Maybe it was. I think so. Yeah, dang. Lynn said, will you be helping Monica with the landscaping at her new house? Yes. In fact, I have a date with Monica this weekend. We're going to go to dinner. First, we're going to go and look at her garden. And uh, then we're going to go out to dinner but and talk about some different options. But I do plan on spending some time. I'll bring you guys along for as much of it as possible. But she did tag some things. And then I want to help her put in some vegetable slash cut flower area. It'll be fun because it's a smaller uh, space completely different kind of vibe and I think that's it'll be fun to be in that sort of space versus you know you know 
flat expanse. We're actually dealing with the slope, a little bit of a slope at her house. So it'll be interesting. Fran said, I'll bet you can answer this. I've always wondered what happens to the unsold trees at the end of the season. Does Andrews hang on to them for the following year? Yes, they do. Did they send them back to the grower? No. Once you buy them and they're at your facility, they're yours. Um, it's very rare to have a bunch of plants left over. There are some years where there's a little bit more they than do others. Sales. They do, yeah. They do big some pretty fall big sale. sales mm -hmm. to get rid of stuff. But they also want to have stuff in stock, living Christmas trees. They do sell a number of those. So they do try in the end of the season to kind of load up on a few of those things so that they can have some to sell for people who want something that they can plant in their garden after Christmas in the following season. Uh, what they do with their plants, perennials, shrubs, Japanese maples, things like that, they go in the greenhouse. And theirs is just a tiny bit bigger than our, I wanna say ours is 36 long, theirs might be 40 long, and theirs is 20 wide and so is ours, mm -hmm. um, I think. I know theirs is a, rough, a little bit bigger than ours. So they were able to fit all of their plants in there this year that they had left over. Uh, and then they groom them up, bring them out, and they're even better for it, I think. Mm -hmm. Spending a winter in a container, uh, it's not a heated structure. It's just there basically to provide protection from wind and drying out too fast. Uh, but those plants come back usually pretty dang strong. Uh, Mimsy said, please tell me you didn't forget to tag the miniature nectarine. I did not, and that's the one that I think I want to put in Alyssa's garden. Mm. Because it's a, another, we're going to do another small space kind of thing, and uh, I think that would be a perfect option. Emma said, oh my, what is the shrub slash topiary 431 on the right? That looks like a pine lollipop, like some kind of a white pine maybe. I don't know the exact variety. It's got kind of blue green, real soft ne needles. Uh, yeah, they're, they are really nice. Sunflower Flight said, do you ever play Shrub Madness? Would you ever consider making a video about the shrubs competing for the shrub of the year? I don't play Shrub Madness. It's a thing that Proven Winners Color Choice does. I've done it, mm -hmm. but I don't even think I actually like really did it the first year. I just don't. You do won it. though. I remember the did first I year. Win? Yeah, you won um, because you. Well, you didn't like at the time. You weren't like playing for because we were already working with. Because we did a video about it, right? Yeah, we showed we, how to do it. Yeah. Uh huh. But you went and did the thing, but you weren't like actually competing to win anything because it would look really weird for like Laura won. Yeah, <laughs> I work with proven winners, but, but you, I won. Yeah, you did it all the way down to at last rose, I think it was, and that was what won back in 2015 or 16. So I did it that year, and did I do it the next year? I can't even remember. I cannot keep track of stuff like that. People like with points programs at stores, they they ask me, "Do you want your phone number?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> I just nothing, no extra details in my brain. I just I don't want to mess with stuff like that. I will enjoy watching other people enjoy it and then I'd be excited to know what the shrub of the year is yeah. in the end. Okay, next video was seed starting a thousand plus annual flowers. So it was, it was time to start our 6 to 8 week before the average last frost date seeds, and that's usually my biggest group. Uh, for perennials, it's the eight to 10 weekers. For annuals, it's the six to eight weekers. Uh, so we just sat down, went through all the varieties I'm gonna be starting this year, and I've had experience with some of them and no experience with others. We have them going. Tons of them are already up. Like, they're all, a lot of them, 12 flats of them are right behind me on the bottom shelf, and then I've got a few more on the other side. And I would say that there's action in every single one of those trays already, which is really exciting. Shirley said, do you know which seeds can be direct sown outside? Cosmos and marigolds are all I know. The ones I have typically direct seeded outside, I've done nasturtiums, cosmos, marigolds, zinnias. Um, I've done calendula, phacelia, uh, mignonette, bachelor's buttons, larkspur, um, bells of Ireland. What else? White finch orlea, I done, I've done nicotiana, just direct sown. What else? I'm trying to think what other things. Sunflowers, of course. Uh, sweet peas. Amaranth. Amaranth is a little bit tri tricky. Those seeds are so tiny, and they need light in order to germinate, so to keep them wet enough, I kind of gave up. I mean, you can do it. I've done it before, but it's you are kind of a... You have to be there all the time, keeping those seeds wet. Melissa said, I grew straw flowers last year and loved them. I harvested dried, hung upside down, and tucked them to you and tucked them to use them for some Christmas gifts. When I found them, they had seed-like fluff all over them. What can I do to avoid this in the coming season? Uh, probably harvest them a little bit earlier. 
I notice that mine keep a lot better when I harvest them when the center is still a little bit more closed. And I don't know enough about straw flowers to know if there's some kind of treatment you can do with them. There might be to where they don't do that, but some of mine that are a little bit longer, longer in the tooth when I harvest them will do that. Their seeds kind of explode. Why, why is that a saying, long in the tooth? I'm not real sure. Hopefully it's... Where'd that come from? I don't know. <laughs> Megan said, what do you do for aphids? I've been overrun for the last two winters and I'm afraid to start seeds in our house this year. I spray with neem oil and essential oils and they won't die. I, ha I hate them so much. You know, that's pretty much what I do too. Oftentimes I need to take like the whole plant and get it in the sink and like wash all the aphids off and then spray it and it seems to do a little bit better that way. Like removing the bug as much as you can um, with water first and then kind of spraying is almost a preventative. You know, I have used the, t it's tomato and vegetable by Bonide. It's a sulfur and pyrethrin based spray for aphids and that's worked really well for me. In fact, that's what I have used primarily in the greenhouse when I have that problem because I feel like it's um, like the most mild but most effective approach. It's worked really well. I've used some insecticidal soap as well. I feel like that one's, you have to be a little bit more like on it with that one. Uh, but tomato and vegetable, you can get it in an RT, uh, ready to use an RTU uh, spray bottle. You might give that a try. It's rarely a once and done though. So like keep that in mind. You might have to spray once every like seven to 10 days, maybe twice, possibly three times to eradicate them completely. Aphids are typically one of the easier ones though. So maybe twice. Kelly said, my daughter and I planted our poppies in the milk jugs and they are sprouting. Are you going to cover how to separate them out of the container or when should we open the lid? You know, it's gonna depend on the area. Like my winter sowing, nothing has sprouted at all because it's just been way too cold. Um, I usually just pop mine open sometime in May. Usually after danger of frost, when everything is looking good outside, I pop the lids open, let them kind of sit like that for a few days so they can get used to being outside and then, or outside their dome anyway. And then I just take them out, separate the plants out, try not to disturb the roots as much as possible and plant them in the ground. Uh, we'll hopefully have a video when we follow we up with that. We did that like three yeah, years was, ago. Yeah, I planted a lot of stuff around the chicken coop. I think yeah. we showed that, yeah. Uh, Brittany versus Boredom said, can you do a video of your favorite flowers that dry really well? I think that's a really good idea. We'll add it to the list. Flute Enthusiast said, you never show or talk about Mahogany Splendor Hibiscus flowers. Do they have any? Not that I've noticed. It's just a foliage plant. They're so, so pretty. Oh my I goodness. I thought you grew that one. I do. Oh. Yeah. But she said you don't talk about it? I haven't ever shown flowers. She's wondering if it has flowers. Uh... Yeah. And I, not that I've noticed. Okay. Have you noticed any flowers on it? I have not noticed okay. any flowers. Pam said, I read about a fan creating strong plants due to helping build strong stem muscles. That is absolutely correct. Is that why you're doing it? Yes. Or is it to keep excess moisture at bay? Both. It helps with a lot of things. Airflow, as you know, out in the garden, when you're pruning things to try to open up the center of the leaf canopy, that's why you're doing it. You're doing it to increase airflow because you'll deal with far less fungal issues. Uh, the plant will receive a lot more light, so the plant itself will be way more productive. Uh, and in here in the grow room, you know, you tend to, uh, things tend to be a lot more moist, you know, because you're keeping a lot of things more moist, especially when they're babies, uh, but you don't want fungal issues to take over either. So it does help with that. And then it helps definitely create strong stems because it's creating a, whatever, a resistance. To the wind. Next video was dahlias taking them out of storage and pre-sprouting. So we just cracked open our dahlia crates. There were five crates that we saved over from last year. You know, most of them we left under the ground and we tarped them, put straw and leaf mulch and grass clippings on top. And I think we've only been down to nine degrees Fahrenheit this winter. I think that's our lowest. And I think they're hardy to 10 degrees, but they're yeah. underneath all of that stuff. So if they haven't rotted from too much moisture, which they shouldn't have, but who knows, and if rodents haven't gotten to them, I think we should be good. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things that could have happened, but I think it's an experiment worth trying. It'll be interesting to see what happens when it all yeah. comes out. But we did dig a whole bunch of clumps, like I can't remember, 70, 75 clumps of the varieties I wanted to make sure to keep. Um, the unfortunate part, and this is why I didn't know what we were gonna find when we opened the crates, was that when we put them in the greenhouse, we didn't realize, we put them down, we had two tables right down the center of our greenhouse. And the heater uh, right here, so there's tables right here, the heater's here, the louvers are pointing straight down at the table, and that's where all the dahlia tubers went that day. And so it dry, that heater kicked on that night. And it was the only available table space though. So you just pile stuff where there's space and you're gonna take care of them the next day. It just wasn't a thought, you know? 
and stuff like that happened. So a bunch of them dried out. We stored them anyway, just to see what would happen. I ended up with enough tubers, a lot of them, albeit from the same varieties, like Sonic Bloom. I have 30 tubers from one mm. clump, divided out to 30. Uh, but I have enough to replant the entire patch if we needed to. Uh, but I have ordered a few new varieties just to pop in here and there. And then uh, what we did was we divided what ended up coming out of storage okay. And then I got them in pre-sprout trays so that, or some of them in pre-sprout sprout trays. Um, and I explained that whole thing, you know, exposing the growth point, the eye of the dahlia to light and heat. It helps spur on growth really quickly. And then you can see which ones are viable and which ones you actually want to pot up and grow on. Uh, anyway, it was it was interesting, like just to see how that whole thing went. Uh, Brian and Tammy said, "Can I ask what would happen if you don't divide the dahlia tubers? Do you get less if you don't divide?" I think eventually it's bad for your plant. I think it's kind of like dividing perennials. You know how like oftentimes ornamental grasses will start to die in the center. I think you'll have some of that going on if you don't divide. So if this experiment works outside in our cut flower garden, what we'll do is we will dig one row per year or part of one row per year to where um, every every clump is being divided at least every three, four years, however long it takes us to get to that row. So we're still going to be doing the project, but not in as big of a... It took like three people two weeks. It was a huge project. I mean, that's what they were doing some other things too, but it was a huge project to, to lift all of those and clean them and get them in storage. It just takes an enormous amount of time. Jenny said, I don't have a local garden center. Where is a good option to order dahlias from? Uh, you know, I've ordered dahlias from Swan Island, been happy with those. I've ordered them from Eden Brothers, been happy with those. I don't think Flora is selling those right now, but she sent me out a bunch of them. Um, in fact, that's where Terracotta and Sonic Bloom both came from. Mm. Those are two of my most productive varieties. Uh, where else? I've picked up a few here and there at shows. Um, I don't think I've actually ordered dahlia tubers from anywhere else that I can think of. Eden Brothers and Swan Island. Nayeli said, I planted a pack of dahlias and my dog dug them up. Can the tubers survive if they were slightly nicked? Just let them dry out. Let the nick dry out and they should be okay. Jennifer said, would it be possible to soak the ones that are dried out similar to the process with ranunculus or are they just a lost cause? I've never seen anything about that or tried it myself. I mean, it maybe it'd be worth a shot. I don't know if that would work or not. Uh, Joan said, you said it's 80 degrees in the greenhouse. I'm assuming that's with the heater. Uh, barely, if it's sunny outside, even if it's cold in winter days, it warms up in there and the heater does not kick on all that much. Um, so it's a, for as inefficient, I feel like, because I can see light underneath the metal tube. I was going to tell you about that, like on mm. the uh, west side. Oh, really? It's like the thing hasn't unrolled. We've kind of had some issues with the rolling of oh. the sides a little bit. There's like, there's light. I can see. I'm like, huh. oh, that's efficient. Um, but even with, you know, the sides overlap so they're not closed and that little gap and, you know, nothing is really sealed up that well. It's a super efficient little space, hmm. I feel like. I mean, the heater's definitely kicking on during nights and overcast days, though. How warm would it be in there without a heater, but just with the sun? Well, 80 that day. Uh, it would definitely cool off a lot in the night. Like, it could get close to freezing in there. Um, yeah, it just depends on the weather. The sun, though, with like the Hartley and this greenhouse, they just heat up so fast. Nancy said, I'm in zone 7B, North Atlanta, and we'll be planting dahlias for the first time ever this year. And I have a couple of questions. One, is there an advantage to dividing the tubers in spring versus in the fall when you dig them up? No, nope. I don't think there's an advantage. I think it's a time thing, uh, also a storage thing. Sometimes they store a little bit better if you haven't, if you just leave them intact and then do all your dividing later on. Um, but I think if you're storing in the right medium uh, and you might have to experiment with that a little bit, I know you're probably a lot more humid than we are here, so it might be a different medium that you use. Uh, but I don't think there's really a disadvantage or advantage. It just depends on when you have time to do it and how you want to store them. And two, if you let them overwinter in the ground, how often should you dig and divide? I would think every couple, two, three years. That's kind of what we're hoping for. Dorothy said, I got a little excited and ahead of myself and bought Dahlia tubers at the big box stores. I've done that too. I have some of those out there. Snow Country, Bluebell, hmm. two of my varieties came from Home Depot. The problem is that they start to sprout and I'm still around two months away from planting time. What should I do with them? Um, put them in a maybe a little bit more of a chilly space to kind of keep that growth at bay or you could pot them up if you've got a sunny spot, sun, really sunny windowsill, pot them up and let them grow and you'll be ahead of the game a little bit. Last video was the greenhouse tidy up. I took after the greenhouse, it needed it horribly bad. I just had junk 
just stuff, stuffed and stashed everywhere in there, especially the front two corners. And it was starting to feel like, uh, it gets after me after a little bit being around clutter. So I spent some time organizing. I also potted up our freesias that I had been keeping in the root cellar for, I think a little bit too long. I don't know if any of them are going to grow. Not daffodils. No, no. Uh, I previewed the video as I normally do. I watch it through once before we publish it. And I put a little marker in where I started to talk about the variety and told Aaron they're a freesia double mix. You can find a picture on Eden Brothers, but I think we should pop a picture in there. And uh, I googled double mix Eden Brothers, and then boop, first picture I saw daffodils. That'll, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> daffodils. So the picture in the video is wrong, but um, that's, you did get a double daff though, so you were oh. kind of close. Well, I, it was called double mix. Yeah. I also finished the dahlias. Uh, I had done the dividing the day before, let them dry overnight, so we finished getting those in their pre-sprouting trays. Joni said, the potting table you're using this video, did you buy it or make it? That came from Gardener Supply. And the one thing about that that I find the most helpful, like it actually has a, a split in the center where you can move the sides and there's like a little drop tray. Mm -hmm. I don't use that at all. What I use are the hooks on the side. There are hooks. I don't mm. know if they came with the table or yeah. if they're, they did. Yeah. I didn't know if they came with it or were accessories. They're like hooks where you can hang tools, but I use that for my hose almost every single day out there because then I don't have to flop the hose on the ground and then bend all the way over to pick it up. I can just put it like hook it on the, <laughs> on the hook and then I just pick it up. It's right at waist level, but I find those hooks so incredibly helpful. You need hooks everywhere in your life. I know they're so nice. Um, Wiltrid said, will you plant flowers in the flower beds beside the gazebo in the park? Mm, I don't know if we're going to be involved in that. Not. Probably not. Because I think they have plans yeah. for what to do. I don't know what they ended up with. There was like a voting. People had to vote on what they wanted done with yeah. the park. They bought The city bought the lot right behind that little park where our, our old gazebo is. So it's now double the size. And they had, uh, they had people in the community voting on what we yeah, wanted them to, to do, do with it. So our, our city has what we call weed money because they legalized uh, marijuana how many years ago? Mm. However many years Five. ago. Was but it, then they I also, le Could but it was, you couldn't sell it within city limits. Yeah. So now you, you can, and they put like a hefty tax on it. And so uh, like a lot of that money goes straight to the city. And I guess it's a lot of money. They've been using that money mostly for um, like beautification, beautification part. projects. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's where they've got some money to spend on, you know, beautifying the park and mm -hmm. yeah, they've got all sorts of plans and hopefully it turns out nice. Yeah. I'm hopeful. Yeah. Heather one, two, three, four said cleaning up a space and getting everything organized is so refreshing. I love dahlias, but don't have the space in my yard to plant them in a flower bed. Do you have recommendations for ones that do well in pots? You know, I would have to go back through and look at sizes, but there are some that, uh, I mean, you can plant any of them in pots as long as you have a way to stake them and if it's a large enough pot, but there are some that stay a lot smaller, especially if you're looking at more single varieties. Um, there are quite like Mystic Illusion. Do you remember that when we mm -hmm. planted that in the round bed with the vertigo? Yeah. Whoa. Those yeah. got big. They did get big. That was kind of a little bit of a loss, the, uh, like the size of the things yeah. took in that space. Everything grew in that particular year. I think we were using leftover. Were we using kind of leftover yeah, plants too? Yeah, or like you got a bunch but didn't order that variety or maybe you did. I, I don't know. There was something about it. I can't remember. Yeah. So we just kind of like put stuff in and come what may and those things just. I can't say I'm a huge fan of the dark foliage on those. I think that they're fine. Maybe in like a certain, maybe they didn't pair as well with the the vertigo. Mm -hmm. Like it was kind of black on black. Yeah, it was, there wasn't enough contrast. I think yeah. that, that was a bad mix. I mean, the plants did great together, but yeah, they both yeah. performed as well as you could hope. I would just double check the size and do something that's in like the two to three foot range rather than the five to six foot range in size. They'll stay a lot more compact and easier to manage in a container situation. Uh, Mickey said, I love watching you and gaining motivation from what you're doing. Curious if you will keep the patch of grass in the greenhouse. Uh, no. We will not. No, what I'm going to do with that is cut it up in pieces and put it in the chicken coop. I think chickens will love, oh, yeah. they, they will, will love, love that. That will keep them entertained for a long time. And then we will take the wood apart and probably use it for a different project. It has been so much fun. The kids, um, Samantha calls it a knick -nick. She wants to go have yeah. a knick -nick, a picnic. Um, and she loves to go out and play bubbles. Uh, it's just a really fun landing spot for the kids. We mm. haven't mowed it or anything. I'm just going to let it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to worry about that. Um, it's just, it's been fun. It's not something I think we'll repeat every single year. It's just fun to do different new things. We'll do something different in that space next year. It was year. a really good thing for a two-year-old. Yeah, it really Have was. Have a place to roll around. Yeah. Also wondering if you've ever considered setting up the high tunnel and planting a patch of your cut flowers there to see how they grow in more shelter slash shade. I've heard others say they get better stem length on some varieties when they do that. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. There are certain things that grow a little bit better with some protection. So it might be something we do at some point. We're definitely not ready at this point to set anything like that up. I've thought about even getting some like shorter things that we can do just down the rows so that individual rows can be sheltered a bit more. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Jenny said, once the dahlias sprout, do you bury the entire tuber and growth? Yes. I've never pre-sprouted the tubers, and I'm curious how deep to plant them. I usually go about three, four inches deep in a container. That's about four inches, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it'll have a little uh, leaves starting to pop out of the tuber, and I just bury the whole thing, and up it comes. Uh, Debbie said, do you reuse the soil once the dahlia tubers and freesias, etc., have sprouted and you move them on? Or have, you, uh, have they taken too many nutrients from the soil? Most of the time, they're like rooted. They're rooted and a lot of the soil goes with them to wherever they end up being planted. And whatever soil gets fluffed off of them usually ends up being spread out somewhere else in the garden. And Nancy said, the freesia photo that popped up is actually double daffodils. <laughs> I yeah. think uh, I love freesia. What are the gray green plants on the large table in the back? Yes, you are correct about the daffodils. Uh, those are helichrysum icicles. So they're part of the Proven Winners uh, Proven Accents line. And I had them all in you know, the white containers this past fall. I ordered them in for a fall project that we didn't end up doing. Um, and I thought, I can't, I'm not just going to like pitch all these plants. No, I'm going to pop these up, let them grow a little bit bigger. They're doing amazing they're starting to bloom in there and then we'll use them this spring somewhere it's kind of it's fun in fact the um nature's willow stuff that i talked about last week has mm -hmm. hello Chrisum in it yeah thought that was interesting and then mary said the greenhouse looks lovely i like tidy too question on the ranunculus you pre-sprouted i saw on a video a couple of days ago are you waiting for nighttime temps to warm up they look ready to push blooms um Yes, I am waiting for the weather to warm up. I've got tulips and the ranunculus and a bunch of other spring plants that as soon as we get, like temperatures at night are staying, like hovering at or above freezing, then I'll start in with some spring planters. We're only going to be able to have them out for such a short time before we plant them in May, if you think about that. That's crazy. Like if I'm planting spring containers at the end of March, they'll only be in there for one month, one and a half months at yeah. most. Sometimes I get a little weary of the season changing a little bit. That's why we don't do as many spring and fall containers. I just can't stomach doing that many at that scale and then having to rip everything out in favor of summer plants. And I think that that was the last question for this week. You know, before we go, I wanted to mention something earlier and I forgot about it, but um, Taylor is our new editor and he's not full-time or anything, but he's helping us with the beautiful garden series videos mm -hmm. that are going up on Saturdays now. So I just want to like throw that out there that I, it sounds like, I think it's going to work out because he's doing a really good job Yeah. and he's going to keep editing just that video for us. Mm -hmm. He's got a full-time job. So I, one I, video yeah, a week, one video a week, but it, it uh, it's certainly a, it's an intensive video to edit. Yeah. It's practically like a full day of editing and to ask Ken to ask you Ken to <laughs> do an extra video on top of the other six that you're editing in a week. That well, would be too it's much. Seven videos a week now yeah. that we're putting out. So mm -hmm. It's just too much for one editor to get to everything. Yeah. There's a lot of other stuff that goes along with editing too, like backing up footage. Oh, organizing. Oh, my nightmare. And then, you know, when you have computer issues or like your SSD fails on you and, mm -hmm. you know, you have to, or things, you know, the audio isn't syncing with the video. You're and, waiting for people like me to send you what you need. Yeah, exactly. Send you files. There's so many things that can slow you down too, mm -hmm. that you, sometimes you're like twiddling your thumbs waiting for stuff to transfer. It's just, yeah. it's a time consuming thing to do. Yeah. So we appreciate you, Ken, and we appreciate you, Taylor, for helping us out with the editing because my goodness. And you guys, that is it for this week's recap video. Hope you're having a great day. Have a great week, and we will see you in the next one.